Welcome to the Moral of the Story podcast, a show in which two cousins, a Harvard lawyer and a Baptist pastor, discuss good stories and explore their moral and ethical meanings from a Christian perspective. I'm the pastor, J. Colin Trisler. She's the lawyer, Evie Brightup. And Evie, today you and I are going to begin our discussion of one of my favorite bro- books. This is Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. And in this episode, we're only going to cover the first few pages of the story, up to the point where our protagonist, Guy Montag, a fireman, he crosses paths with a 17-year-old girl named Clarice McClellan, and she turns his life upside down and opens his eyes to the truth, uh, to the reality that surrounds him. And we'll take a deep dive into the characters of Montag and Clarice, and we'll explore the world in which they live. Now, a little bit before we get started, uh, a little bit about the book. Ray Bradbury, he wrote this book back in 1953. And Fahrenheit 451 is a dystopian novel set in this nebulous future in which books are outlawed. People cannot own or possess books. And firemen like Montag, they don't come and put out fires like firemen today. They start fires. They come in and they burn books and they burn the homes of anyone who has books in their possession. And here at the beginning of the story, Montag loves his job as a fireman. He loves starting fires. He finds great pleasure in watching the flames consume the pages of books. He's thinking that he's doing a real service to society by burning these books. He absolutely loves his job. But upon meeting a strange and fascinating teenage girl named Clarice, who lives in his neighborhood, Montag and, and I, like, I like the way that uh, Wikipedia phrased this here. It says, Montag quickly becomes disillusioned with his role of censoring literature and destroying knowledge. And he eventually quits his job and commits himself to the preservation of literary and cultural writings. I thought that was a good summary. And I also like the quote uh, at the beginning of the story from the Spanish poet Juan Ramon Jimenez that Bradbury used. He used it to open the story. He said, if they give you ruled paper, write the other way. And I, I really thought that uh, quote was cool. It's a good summary of the theme of our episode today and the, of the story in general. And that theme is don't just blindly accept the reality that people try to force upon you. It's important to discover the truth for yourself. Don't just take someone else's word for it. Yeah, it reminds me, I'm preaching through the book of Acts on Sundays in my church, and uh, we went over Acts 17 not too long ago. In the Bereans in Acts 17, Paul went into the synagogue and he reasoned with the people from the scriptures. He used the scriptures to explain and prove that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to die and and to raise again from the dead. And the Bereans, like Luke says, Luke wrote the book of, of Acts, it says the Bereans received the word with all eagerness. They were examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. And I really like that attitude. That's what I tell my people in my congregation. I'm going to preach this to you. Don't take my word for it. You know, read the scripture. You keep me accountable and you see for yourselves that what the Bible says here is true. The Bereans did that. They didn't just take Paul's word for it. They searched the scriptures daily to make sure that what Paul was telling them was the actual truth. They were doing the work to discover the truth for themselves. And that's what we need to do as well today. We need to do the work and discover the truth for ourselves. And there's one other quick thing here. You know, these preachers, they got to bring the Bible into everything. It reminds me of Jesus and his conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. Uh, There in John uh, 4, I think it's uh, uh, 39 through 42, I think of the verses there, when the Samaritans uh, said to, you know, Jesus told the woman at the well that, that he was the Messiah, and she believed him, and she went to go tell other people about Jesus, and she went and told them, and she brings them back to meet Jesus, and the people that she brought back to meet Jesus, they said, we no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. They, they listened to the woman but then they came to see the Christ for themselves. They came to see Jesus for themselves. And then they made their own decision, made up their own mind when they heard the truth for, for themselves. And that's what I really like about Jesus. He, he never told anybody 
to just take his word for it. He told them to examine the evidence and make up their own minds. That's why he, he, he did these miracles. And he, he did these teachings. He fulfilled the prophecy of the Old Testament. And he said, look at the evidence. The phrase, uh, come and see, it, it, it occurs frequently throughout the Gospel of John. Uh, you know, there with Philip and with John the Baptist as well. They asked Jesus, are you the Messiah? John the Baptist asked Jesus if he was the Messiah. And Jesus didn't give him a straight answer there. He didn't give, he didn't give him a yes or no answer. He says, what does the evidence tell you? Is this happening? Is that happening? Is this going on? Is this scripture being fulfilled? You take a look at that. You see the evidence for yourself, and you make up your own mind. And I really like that. And uh, I think this book, Fahrenheit 451, it does a good job of teaching that same lesson here, to think for yourself, look at the evidence for yourself. Don't just accept the narrative that people are trying to feed you, and you make up your own mind. What do you think about that, Evie? I think that's true, but I think it also presents a very balanced perspective, which is you should get input from other people. Other people mm. are meant to help to participate in a conversation with you and to lead you into the truth. I mean, and so, for example, you look at Jesus and he would do miracles. He would give people evidence to see that he was who he said he was. And then later when he says things that you can't you know, test, when he tells you what's going to happen at the, the end of the ages, you accept that because he's proven that mm -hmm. he is someone who has authority to speak. He's proven that he's God and therefore that what he's saying is authoritative, that you you, you um, need to examine that he is who he says he is. And when you come to that conclusion, then you can accept that what he says is, is correct because of who he is. Um, if you, about, you get back to Fahrenheit 451, it's, you're, you're dealing with other people who don't have that level of authority. You, you, you encounter you encounters Clarice, he encounters Faber, the professor. These are not people who just inherently have an authority where whatever they say is true. Um, they're not Jesus. Um, at the same time, any other people that we interact with, when they're being sincere, they're trying to find the truth, they can't help but lead us to the truth. They might be wrong and on some things, but, you know, we speak with other people. Um, I, I, I think of a scene later where, um, I think we're not going to discuss this, this here, but since it's kind of pertinent to the, the point you're making, um, Montag has Faber in his ear, and then he's got, um, he's got his boss, Beatty, who's speaking to him, he's got those two different voices and, and he's got to sort out well, which voice do I listen to? But it, it's never, it's never about just you on your own. It's about you in dialogue with other people trying to come to conclusions, not being led or manipulated, but working together with others to come to the, the truth. And I think that actually you get down to, that's what a book is. It's, it's somebody else sharing their mind with you so that you can put your mind to it. And that's how, that's how we come up with things, how we come up with ideas and how we start to understand the world. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and mm -hmm. you know, Paul was sharing that with the Bereans, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it was him taking that message and giving it to them and them deciding for themselves that it was true. And it was the lady at, at the well, she went and told these people about Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and then they, on her word, yes. they came and, and saw Jesus for themselves. So, I mean, there is, there is that interaction there. And I really like how you framed it there. That's what a book is too. A yeah. book is interacting. And, and I, I remember uh, reading something about John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And uh, Jefferson's books were all pristine. There was not a mark in them. But uh, when Adams would read a book, he, would, he was constantly underlining things and making notes in the margins and kind of arguing. If, if there was something he disagreed with, he would write that argument kind of in the margins of the book. His books were kind of devoured because you know, he, I mean, he really physically interacted with the books. And that's what I do when I read a book. That helps me really understand and get the point across, understand why I believe if a book says something, why I believe this to be correct or why I believe something to be incorrect. So I'm constantly interacting with the book as well. And that's what books do. That's what people do. And that's what makes it real is when you see for yourself. You know, yeah. you don't just take somebody else's word for it. Somebody else's word might prompt you. But mm -hmm. you hear somebody else, uh, their, their prompt, and then you go and see for yourself, and you discover it for yourself, and that's what makes it real. And, and that's what uh, you know, Clarice has done here with Montag. I mean, he's going along just kind of fine and dandy, and then he bumps into her, and she flips his whole life around. And I, I really like that aspect of the story and how it makes 
and you pointed that out here early on how books serve that same purpose as well. Yes, and I think that's what, what we see in this world is in, in a Fahrenheit 451, what we see in the world of Fahrenheit 451 is a world where people are not communicating with each other. They have their headphones in, which of course we do at yes. the moment, also have our headphones in, but they're, they're separated from each other. They're not, they're not really talking. They're having other things fed into them to avoid interacting with other people because that's how you, that's how you find out how you think is by talking to others are reacting against what someone else says. Someone says something and it seems true and you, you follow it up and, you know, you, but you don't really have that knowledge for yourself until you have thought through it. And maybe they've helped you through the same line of reasoning. And you get to that point. You didn't really know that until you got there for yourself. That that's why we need other people. Sometimes you come to a conclusion by the way you react to what against what someone else is saying, but we still we need those other people, whether it's in a book or, you know, whether you're reading something on the internet that someone says, well, that's wrong. You know, you just see it in a way, but that's just so wrong. But you have to think through, well, why is that wrong? Where foundationally does this person start off differently and therefore they come to a different conclusion than you? But that feedback from other people is, is what makes us more intelligent. And it, it, it helps us bounce ideas off of each other. And, and, and we are better able to discover the truth when we're working together. And that's one, exactly. of, the sin, that's one of the sinister things about the, the bad forces in this book. They are trying to isolate people. And you become dumber when you are isolated from other people. This has kind of been a verse that's we've bounced back and forth off of each other throughout Pride and Prejudice and maybe even in the road as well. I can't remember. And here we are bringing it up again. That mm -hmm. iron sharpens iron, you know, exactly. And the more you interact with people, you, the, the, the more the more feedback you get, mm -hmm. the, the more thorough your conclusions are. You know what I mean? Because if, mm -hmm. if I say something like I have a, a random idea. And I'm able to bounce that off of you. And you, you could say, Colin, that doesn't make any sense. And I say, really? Why not? And you go, well, here, think about this. And now, oh, okay, well, now that you pointed that out, I see that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, and, and that's what that good feedback with each other does. It tells us, helps us realize when we're on the right track or when we're kind of veering off. And, and the more we are separated from each other, like they are in this book, the dumber we as individuals are and the dumber we as a society are, and the dumber a society is, an ignorant society is more easy to manipulate and control mm -hmm. and overtake, overthrow, you know? And uh, that's, that's what you see going on here in this book. I think that's exactly right. You know, I'm reminded of something else in Proverbs is that throughout it's saying well, you should seek advice from people. You know, a wise man will have many advisors. Mm -hmm. He doesn't just have one advisor and do whatever that person says. You get a lot of, a lot of viewpoints, and that's how you come to a wise conclusion. But that's, that's also something you just have to learn from experience of when do you listen to a bunch of advisors and then when do you say, well, actually, I think all of these perspectives are wrong. I mean, that's, I think, something you spend your whole life trying to learn is how to, how to work through different perspectives and come to a conclusion. Because especially I think the world we live in, too, is so fragmented and you get so many different you can get such different advice from so many different sources so. you get yourself into real trouble when you put yourself in an echo chamber yeah yep and you true. you don't experience any differing viewpoints it's mm -hmm. very important to read people that you disagree with you know mm -hmm. you, you have to go into that conversation and say i might actually have something i can learn from this person even if i disagree with some of their fundamental tenets and even if you fundamentally disagree with everything that they say, that can at least you, you read that and you interact with it, that can at least be beneficial for you because it helps you clarify why exactly you believe the things that you do. They may make a good point, like say I'm talking with an atheist or whatever, and they yeah. may make a point and uh, I'm able to refute that point and it, you know, it just further clarifies something that I believe in my mind. You know, that's why disagreeing with somebody is not a bad thing you and i mm -hmm. could disagree about something and still be civil and have a very nice friendly relationship about it you know what i mean just because mm -hmm. you disagree with somebody doesn't mean that person is your enemy i guess it depends on what you're talking about if you're talking with a member of the taliban or whatever you know that person might be your enemy they may want to try to kill you 
but it most in most circumstances, you know, just mm-hmm. because somebody disagrees with you doesn't mean that you have to completely write that person off forever. You might yeah. actually have some benefit in interacting with that person. All right. So let's start off here. I like the first lines of stories. I think they really, you, you got to have a really good first line to set the tone for the story. Mm-hmm. And he starts here. Bradbury does. The story starts off with this opening line. It was a pleasure to burn. You know, he's speaking at it from Montauk's point of view here. It was a pleasure to burn. It was a pleasure to see things blackened and changed and destroyed. And he describes the fire hose as a python, as a snake, as a serpent. And he describes the kerosene, you know, they, they spew out that kerosene. They're starting fires. Remember, they're not spraying water to put out a fire. They're spray, spraying kerosene to start a fire. And he describes that kerosene as the, the, the serpent's venom that it spews upon the world. And I think that kind of harkens back a little bit to the serpent in the garden. You know, that mm-hmm. the, the, the serpent comes and spews his venom and his lies and, and, and that, you know, changes and, and brings destruction upon the world. And uh, Montag is a fireman. He's uh, Bradbury. And I really like Bradbury as a writer. He's one of those guys you can just tell he's just excited to be alive. He's excited to be writing. And he could, there are some people that tell you, if you can say, you've, you've written this in 10 words. If you can say it in five, you should shorten it to five. That might be good some of the time. Bradbury, he's like, if I can say it in 10, I want to try to say it in 15. You know, he just likes to throw a lot of words in there and it doesn't get jumbled up. I think he does a really good job at that. And uh, he describes Montag as being like this conductor of a symphony who's kind of conducting this destructive melody that burns down the history of the world into a heap of uh, charcoal and and ruins. And he describes it as destruction as art. And and, and that's why Montag is so happy. He, He really thinks he's doing a good job is because they see destroying as an art form, the firemen have been taught to find pleasure in destruction, in tearing down. Destruction in this world here of Fahrenheit 451, this dystopian future, destruction has come to be seen as something that's beautiful. And that destruction and destroying is a work of art in and of itself to be proud of. Destruction represents the, the best in humanity. And the firemen have set out to, rather than the firemen we think of today, who set out to protect and preserve these firemen, they set out to devour. They set out to destroy and to blacken, to, to stain, to, to taint uh, history. They've changed, they, they've wiped out the, the books and they, they've, they've been able to change the past. And when you can change the past, you can manipulate the present and change the future. They, they, and they pervert and they turn something that was good and they destroy it. They take beauty and they turn it into ash. And this is a, a corruption of reality in an attempt to deform reality because they're not really replacing these, these pieces of work that have stood the test of time. They're not really replacing them with anything. You, you know, I mean, when you deconstruct yeah. something, they're deconstructing something. And instead of putting something back up in its place, it's almost like there's just, I mean, they're, they're manipulating, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to change the, the past and create their own agenda here, create their own narrative. But they're not really replacing these things with anything substantive or better. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, the thing about fire is you're taking things that are different, different objects, and you're making them all the same. You're mm-hmm. reducing them all to the same ash. And I think that's a lot of what's trying to go on here. You, you don't want to have individuals all thinking different things. You don't want them connecting with each other and forming a, a real society where you've got different people interacting and having real relationships. You want it reduced all to the same, the same thing, and it's a nothingness, right? Yeah, that, that pale gray ash, nothing of vibrancy, nothing of color. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had read this before and sort of remembered what's pro books and sort of anti-TV. Well, that's not necessarily the case because mm-hmm. there's a comment at one point. Well, they, they could show th- things on mm-hmm. the screen that would be helpful to us, that would convey knowledge, mm-hmm. that would be good. 
Um, but they don't. They just show this mindless stuff to, to numb people. They, you, they don't want people having real emotions. They want to keep everybody numb. Like I, I'm thinking later in the book that we'll get to, there's, there's the wife um, whose husband is going to war and she's disconnected from her own emotions. About the, and that's what's intentionally being done to everybody. You know, they don't, we don't want people knowing what they feel and having intense feelings, but you can't, you just can't eliminate that part of humanity. It's, it's there. And, you know, you look at Montag and he encounters Clarice and all of those things that are there are actually coming to the surface. And, and the mm-hmm. same thing with his wife in another way, she thinks she's happy, but down below the surface, she's desperately unhappy. Right. That's what this destruction as art here at the beginning, mm-hmm. this destruction as an art form, it's not changing things. Like you said, it's not changing things for the better. It, this mm-hmm. isn't growth. You know, this isn't like lifting weights. You know, when you lift weights, you cause trauma to your muscle, you tear it down and then mm-hmm. it, you, you, you it properly and it rebuilds it stronger. So it's a, it's yeah. a controlled destruction there. You know, you're tearing it down and in order to build it up stronger, this, what we've got going on here, this is not growth. This is just reduction. This is just destruction and reducing. And it's not in the process of growth. And no. the fireman Montag, he really loves his job. You know, it describes him here at the very beginning. He's at ease. He's joyful. He's at peace among the fireflies of burning, dying books. You know, I think is how Bradbury described it there. And he, 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 and when he's, when he's this, this very opening scene, when he's shooting out the kerosene and he's burning the books and he's starting the fires, Montag is grinning with this moral authority. You know, I'm on the, you hear this phrase a lot, the right side of history. You know, you hear that side, you hear that, that phrase a lot today. And Montag is smiling because he thinks that he is morally right. He's on the right side of history. He, he's, he's smiling with that smile of contentment that comes with doing the right and moral thing. And that's what he's been taught. That's what they, you know, have convinced him of. And he's got this, uh, he's completely bought in to the conventional morality that this destructive pyromaniacal society has sold him. He, he, they, they fed him this narrative that you're on the right side of history here, man. What you're doing is right and it's good. And Montag is bought into it. And that's why he is so happy here, seemingly happy. You know, we, we yeah. see here he's not really happy, but he thinks he is. And uh, Bradbury describes it there. When he burns, it's like he's putting on a show. You know, Bradbury mm-hmm. describes Montag as a man who winks at himself as a minstrel man, a guy who's, you know, people there watching, watching him, putting, putting on the, put, burning down the, the house, burning down the fire, burning down the books and putting on a show. He sees himself as somebody who is doing a public service. He possesses a total sense of self-righteousness. He is totally conformed to the morals of his society. And, and that's what happens when morals, I guess, are left up to the whim of just society, you know, cultural changes. Uh, just because a culture says something is right doesn't make it right you know more morality is objective we could legalize and i mean some we we do legalize murder you know here in the united states you know, with abortion and just because it's legal doesn't make it right you know and i think of some people who go and have abortions and they think they're doing the right thing there and they're, 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 they don't realize that they're killing and but they possess this total sense of self-righteousness and montag has that same sense of self-righteousness here and then this uh let me uh mention this a uh, couple of scriptures here it reminded me of and i'll toss it to you uh when when timothy i'm sorry when uh, paul said in titus chapter 1 verse 16 he said they profess to know god but they deny him by their works they are detestable disobedient and disqualified for any good work so there are people uh, paul was saying that that think they are doing the work of god but they are detestable and they're disqualified from any good work because even though they think they're doing right, they are doing wrong. And then Jesus said, uh, John chapter 16, he said, telling his disciples, he said, they will ban you from the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you 
will think he is offering service to God. They will do these, th- do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. So the people who will persecute and murder the apostles, they think they're doing a service to God, but really they don't know the Father. They don't know the Son, but they think that they are morally right. And that, that's kind of what Montag reminds me of here at the beginning. I think that's right. We, but we learn later that he already has that tension within himself. He's yes. been, he's been stealing books yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Um, so if he's divided within himself, and I think that's true to human nature. I mean, a lot of times mm-hmm. we, we, in one context, you, you think you think one thing. And then in another context, you, you behave contrary to what you think you believe. And then, yeah. you know, we've got to sort through all of that. And it's, it's complicated and sometimes it's, it's interesting, but it, it really can be scary too, because we, we know we're divided within ourselves and sometimes we think we have good motives and we don't like you're saying, and it's, you know, it, it ought to give us like pause or humility to say, you know, and th- when I do this, I think I'm doing the right thing, but w- let me examine that. Let me talk to other people and find out. Exactly. And I, I love how you pointed that out there is that, He's doing, he's going through all the motions. He's putting on a show of burning down somebody's house that has books in it. And he thinks he's doing the right thing. But what's he got stashed away in his house? Some books. And, 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 and that's the conscience inside each and every one of us. You know, we've kind of, I wouldn't say committed ourselves, but, but we, we get so enamored and acting a certain way, but yet there's that little part of us that's kind of pulling us back to the light. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and, and Montag has not completely gone so far in, in toward the darkness that he's given himself over to it. That conscience is still there, you know, and, and he's learning. Yeah. And that's what Clarice brings to the fore here. She, she helps him process the, that conscience. And uh, one, one last thing about Montag here, he is completely guilt-free about destroying a person's private property. And not just a person's private property, but a person's home. Think, think about that. Think, think of the mindset of somebody who has no qualms about burning down another man's house that he lives in with his family. And uh, when Montag leaves the station, uh, Bradbury describes his world as one of soft comfort and elegant simplicity. And I've often... I figured this out about the devil. He often strives to make us comfortable. The devil does. He wants us to get fat and lazy and stuck in our comfort. And Montag here is comfortable. He fits right in with society, even though there's a little part of him deep down in there that knows this is not right. And uh, like you said, that, that, that little part there, it's, it's, it's that, that, that's that conflict within all of us. And so this is where we start off. This is where Montag starts off from. So he's not some guy who's convicted, just just outwardly and ob- obviously convicted here about doing this. He's not uh, burning down this person's home here at the beginning and doing it with a long face or doing it with a sense of guilt. You know, he, he knows that society is telling him he's doing the right thing and he's comfortable. But then there's that little niggling conscience in there and uh, he meets Clarice here, he, Clarice mm-hmm. McClellan, and he she introduces him to uh, to reality, and starts his journey on discovering the truth for himself. And I would say she serves as the call of conviction here, the physical embodiment of conviction, because Montag's whistling. Yeah, he, he's gone to the fire. He's gone back to the station. He's changed. He's off work. He's heading home. He's whistling and making his way home as usual when Bradbury says, a gust of wind had sprung up from nowhere as if someone had called his name. Now, this might seem innocuous, but preacher man is going to notice stuff like this. In the Bible, wind and spirit are the same word in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's pneuma in the New Testament and ruach in the Old Testament. And uh, this, this gust of wind that sprung up out of nowhere as if someone was calling his name to me, this just seems like the spirit of God that is uh, reaching out to Montag and convicting him and uh, trying to jar him 
out of his comfort with a quick gust of conviction. And uh, this is how God usually works, wouldn't you say? I, I think kind of, I don't know if Bradbury was you know, going for that here, but it, it, it fits in with the story because that's how God usually works. You're comfortable in your sin, and then this, this gust of conviction comes out of nowhere. And if you pay attention to it, it can really change your life. That's how God usually works in my experience. I think that's right. And I think that that can be in the story and it really is in the story, whether the author intended it or not. I mean, there's a reason that these ideas and these, these images and, and metaphors are appealing and it's because they, they resonate with truth, whether even you know, the author is, is totally aware of that or not. I mean, from what I understand of Bradbury's background, he, he probably was thinking of that. I mean, I understand he was you know, someone who believed in God. And so that may very well have been what he was thinking of. But I mean, in, in a way, I think it's there whether he meant it to be there or not. Yeah, I mean, he was a uh, Baptist. Uh, and, and the reason I mentioned this is because, and I, I don't think it's just, I'm shoehorning that in here. Mm -hmm. He mentions the Bible and scripture frequently throughout yes. Fahrenheit 451. So it's not unheard of for us to kind of look at it in this way, because he's frequently cited, you know, Ecclesiastes and, and mm -hmm. the Gospel of Luke, uh, yeah, these, these, these other scriptures, you know, he's bringing that up. And uh, I would say this is Bradbury's way of saying this is how God, in a sense, is intervening here in Montag's life. God steps in when everything seems right with Montag, and he lets Montag know that, in fact, things are not right. Things are very wrong, and Montag has been playing a role in the wrongdoing that is impacting the entire world. And, and, and that's, that's, that's what the Holy Spirit does. Sometimes, I, now, I'm not saying never, sometimes God will just completely knock you on your behind. But yeah. I, a lot of the time, it's just that small little voice, you know? Yeah. And then Bradbury goes on to write, he says, the last few nights, he had had the most uncertain feelings about the sidewalk just around the corner here. So Montag had been taking the same walk home, and the last few nights, something was a little different. He said he had most uncertain feelings about the sidewalk just around the corner here, moving in the starlight toward his house. He had felt that a moment prior to his making the turn, someone had been there. The air seemed charged with a special calm, as if someone had waited there quietly, and only a moment before he came simply turned to a shadow and let him through. Perhaps his nose detected a faint perfume, Perhaps the skin on the backs of his hands on his face felt the temperature rise at this one spot where a person standing might raise the immediate atmosphere 10 degrees for an instant. There was no understanding it. Each time he made the turn, he saw only the white, unused, buckling sidewalk. And perhaps on one night, something vanishing swiftly across a lawn before he could focus his eyes or speak. And this is the essence, the spirit of someone he connects with. And that person that he's uh, gonna connect with here is Clarice. And things here are supposed to be good in Montag's life. I mean, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing good at my job. I mean, everybody says I'm, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I'm morally righteous here, but something's just off. And we've all been in that situation. You know, sometimes the things should be good, but there's just something that's off here. Like he's missing something. And the truth is that Montauk's been living in a fantasy world. The truth is that there is a reality that exists just beyond that thin veil of deception that, that, that shrouds the truth. And, I, and Montag now is starting to experience that call of the Holy Spirit, that call, and, 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 and the Holy Spirit works through people as well. You know, like we talked about Paul and the Bereans, the woman at the well going to get the people and bringing them back to see Jesus. And now Montag doesn't just discover the truth for himself, just, you know, as some sort of revelation or something. He was in the Clarice who instructs him and helps him uh, awaken his mind, open his eyes and start to see the world as it really is and not as this false narrative that Montag has been led to believe. Well, what do you think is the significance of his needing to encounter Clarice before he's ready to encounter what's inside the books? Hmm, that's a good question. I think that Clarice makes it real. 
you know, yeah. books exist in this, in the intellect, in the spiritual, in the conscious, but to see those, those principles that you read about in books and to see it embodied in the real world, that makes it real. It's mm-hmm. different to, uh, to read about Superman and then it's something completely different to see somebody who acts like Superman in real life, you know? Yeah. And I mean, Superman, not with the flying, not with the strength, not with the lasers, but a super man, a, 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 a good man. That's what makes him super. He is a good man because Jonathan and Martha Kent raised him to be a good man and to read about a good man, somebody like Superman, but then to see somebody in real life, like your father or a brother or, or a sister or your mother, somebody like that, who actually embodies these qualities, that makes it real and tangible. And that's why I think that you need to have that human interaction in addition to books. You know, books alone, are, are that's just not going to do it for you. You got to apply that knowledge and that wisdom into the real world. I think that Montag sees Clarice as a living embodiment of Somebody who's different because the, uh, the people of the world, they call her strange. She's odd. Mm. She's not like everybody else. And she's kind of looked down upon and ostracized. But she's the most normal person in this story. <laughs> you know? Yeah. She really is. You, you brought up the question. I, I think that Clarice makes it real. What, I mean, what do you think? I think that's right. I think that we're, we're people, we're, we are bodies. We're not just minds you know mm-hmm. we can't just communicate directly mind to mind i mean we we communicate using our bodies and i think that the people that you see you see the face you see their their eyes and you see you know all of the ways you can express yourself with the body i think that there's so much more that that can be said i mean i, I think books are wonderful and powerful but you're really you're encountering countering words and you're sort of seeing someone else's mind in a way through a veil mm-hmm. And in a way, a book can cut through and you can, you can get to know someone in a way you wouldn't in real life. But I also just think when another person is physically present with you or, you know, even just interacting over Zoom or whatever, and you can see the face. It's, you know, that all these things are, are part of being a human. And we can't just, the mind doesn't just exist apart from who we are. I mean, we've got it. It's the wholeness of, of who a person is. Exactly. It's integrated. We are yes. not just, we are not just spirit. We are, and we are never intended to just be spirit. Mm-hmm. And in the, the new age, when, when the Lord returns, we're not going to just be spirit. Yes. Uh, the, the new earth is going to be this physical earth and our spirit. We are, we were always meant to be a, an integration of spirit and body. And so consciousness is great, but you need to have a place to act out the consciousness in the real world and that is what the physical bodies do and that's what clarice embodies here the physical existence mm-hmm. the physical embodiment of these things that you can learn from books to to, to live that out in the real world I, I like what bradbury writes here of montag he says tonight he slowed almost to a stop he's continuing his walk home his inner mind you know his his spirit his soul reaching out to turn the, the corner for him and, and I like that his, his soul, his inner mind is reaching out to turn a corner, you know, to make a change, to uh, a subconscious longing to change, to answer this, this call of conviction here. And it says he heard the faintest whisper. And again, that's like the voice of God. I think of Elijah, you know, when God called out to Elijah with that still small voice, when, you know, when Elijah was hiding in the cave and uh, Elijah thought that things were one way and God showed him, no, things are something that's, things are completely different. Reality is something that's completely different. And uh, that's, you know, what Clarice is doing here. He, he hears, uh, and then Bradbury writes, does he hear a a faint, a whisper? Is it breathing that he hears? And again, that, that whisper, that breath, that, that spirit, he says, or was the atmosphere compressed merely by someone standing there very quietly waiting and then it says he turned the corner. And I think this is a significant phrase. I think that the conviction that the Lord had laid upon his heart here, he was ready to receive something different. He was ready to receive here the truth. And then if you'll notice when Bradbury brings Clarice in, he injects a very uh, ethereal mood 
into this paragraph in which he introduces Clarice. I know I've been reading a lot of it here, but I'm going to read this and then I kind of toss it to you. He said, this is the paragraph when he introduces Clarice. The autumn leaves blew over the moonlit pavement in such a way as to make the girl who was moving there seem fixed to a sliding walk, letting the motion of the wind, you know, again, the wind, the spirit, and the leaves carry her forward. Her head was half bent to watch her shoes stir circling leaves. Her face was slender and milk white, and it was a kind of gentle hunger. And in it was kind of a gentle hunger that touched over everything with tireless curiosity. So she is hungry for the truth. She is experiencing reality. She's not like everybody else who's going by so fast and everybody who's got seashells in their ears or they've got some, their eyes glued to some screen. She's actually interacting with the world around her. You know, she's actually interacting with reality, not something that's being pumped into her mind, but something she's seeing for herself. And uh, her, you know, uh, her face was slender, milk white. She interacted with everything with a tireless curiosity. It was a look almost of pale surprise. The dark eyes were so fixed to the world that no move escaped them. You know, she's in tune. She's in harmony with the reality that surrounds her, Clarice is. Her dress was white, and it whispered. So again, she's portrayed as white. Her dress is white. It's almost this kind of angelic, you know, heavenly, ethereal sort of atmosphere going on here. Uh, righteous, you know, actual righteousness here. Yes. He almost thought he heard the motion of her hands as she walked. And the infinitely small sound now, the white stir of her face turning when she discovered she was a moment away from a man who stood in the middle of the pavement waiting. And he goes on to say the girl stopped and looked as if she might pull back in surprise. So she's just kind of doing her thing there and she runs into Montauk. She's just, she looks up and there's this man standing there and she stopped and, you know, she thought she might pull back in surprise, but instead she stood regarding Montauk with her eyes so dark and shining and alive that he felt he had said something quite wonderful. But he knew his mouth had only moved to say hello. And then when she seemed hypnotized by the salamander on his arm and the phoenix disc on his chest, and this is the symbol of the, the fire department, he spoke again. Of course, he said, you're our new neighbor, aren't you? Clarice says, and you must be. She raised her eyes from his professional symbols and she said, the fireman. And her voice trailed off and... Uh, so she sees his public professional symbols there that I guess would kind of identify him, you know, but she, as we see here, she sees the man beneath the emblems, you know, the man beneath the salamander, the man beneath the phoenix, the, not just the fireman, she sees Guy Montauk. And I mm -hmm. thought that was, when you're going to introduce a character that the, in the role that Clarice plays, I just don't think you get a better setup than that. That was really good. Yeah, and I think he does a good job of, of trying to show us her character through different physical characteristics, but then also through the way she acts um, and the way that she, the way she reacts to Montag. And she sees the symbols. You can, I think you can tell there's a little bit of a negative reaction to the symbols. She doesn't really, she's obviously not glad that he's a fireman, but I think you're absolutely right. She sees something beyond that. And that, that's important because he may not see that about himself yet. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I, I think it was, it's, it, we talked about using the senses here, you know, she's really interacting with reality around her. And Clarice said that she would have known that Montag was a fireman without even seeing him. And he asked if it was the smell of the kerosene that gave him away, you know, that, that smell, that's something you can't do on a screen. You know, you can look at a screen, you can put earbuds in your ears, but you can't smell, you know, and she's really utilizing all of her senses here to make judgments about the world. She's using her sensory uh, observations to, to make judgments about the, the world that surrounds her. And she could, without even looking at him, she could just smell the kerosene dripping off of him and know that he was a fireman. And this is that, that lingering, you know, serpent's venom is the way uh, Bradbury described it earlier. Uh, but to Montag, Montag, the kerosene, he says, nothing but perfume to me. That kerosene is sweet. You know, it's sweet because he knows of no other way to think of it. Mm -hmm. To him, that's what sweetness smells like because that's what he's been indoctrinated with. You know, but she doesn't see it as a perfume smell. She sees it as kind of rank and uh, as is what it is. It's uh, the liquid of destruction. And Clarice, 
she might have been put off a little bit by Montauk here, but they walk back together. And, uh, you yeah, know, because they live in the same neighborhood. And he finds her very strange. I remember she's 17 years old. I say Montag here is in, is in his 30s, I believe. And, yeah. uh, and, and one thing I want to make clear, there's never the, the hint of romantic interest here at all between the two of them. Yeah, I you think know? that's an important point to make because it, it can seem a little bit, if, if you read that into it, of course, it's, it's creepy and inappropriate that he would have this romantic whatever it is, flirtation or whatever with a 17-year-old who's his neighbor when he's married. But that, that, isn't, that isn't in the story. I mean, you can, you can try to see that there, but I, I, don't think that's what's, I don't think that's what this is about. And this is about his encountering someone who is, is virtuous and who helps yes. bring him to life. And there are other, I think we live in a society that kind of sees sex in everything. And that's not what's going on here. There's other kinds of relationships that you have with people. There's other ways to interact with people. And I think that, um, it, it can kind of taint the way we see other things because me reading through it, I was just sort of like that. That's a, that's a little bit sketchy maybe. And, but I think you're right. We, we need to understand that there are other kinds of relationships just because it's a man interacting with a woman. That's not. That's and this was, on. this was written in 1953. And so it's today's standard. Usually you see, you know, uh, there's the, there's the leading actor. There's the leading actress. You know, they're going to get together at the end of the movie, whether it's mm-hmm. Raiders of the Lost Ark or whether it's, how to lose a guy in 10 days, whatever the genre is. And so our, we've been kind of conditioned by the stories we read by just, oh, there's a man, there's a woman, but there must be something romantic going to come of this. And, and that's not what the way Bradbury portrays it at all. It's, yeah, it, I do think that was true in 1953, though, as well. I, I it think, could have been. Yeah, it, absolutely. I think that was, I think stories were just as formulaic. Here's the leading man, here's the leading woman. I think all the more so, actually. Um, but I don't think that's what he's. Portraying. Oh no, no, it's it's pretty certain because that, that never comes up, you know. He he never just dis- it, it's that that sexual component is never brought into it, and uh, they they walk, and uh, they're walking to their homes, and Clarice asks a lot of questions. Somebody who is interested in knowledge and knowing things, and he asks her, "What are you doing out so late? How old are you?" You know, so it seems he, he here, this is one of those, those little hints. How old are you? You know, not like he's, he's not attracted to her. He sees her as a, a child almost, yeah. you know. And as they walk, uh, Bradbury, you know, he emphasizes the idyllic and peaceful atmosphere that surrounds them. He talks about the wind and bread. You know, he, he keeps mentioning those aspects. They walked in the warm, cool, blowing night on the silvered pavement where there was the faintest breath of fresh apricots and strawberries in the air. Again, that, that smell, you know, actually interacting with the real world, not something on a screen. He looked around and he realized that this was quite impossible so late in the year that fresh apricots and strawberries should be so prevalent, something that in this world at this time should not exist, but it does. And I think that's symbolic of Clarice, somebody like this who should not exist, somebody who's able to think for herself, somebody who's actually uh, hasn't bought into the narrative and who interacts with her family and loves to interact with people and loves to interact with the world. It seems like these people and loves to interact with books. It seems like these people have been filtered out of society, but yet here's one of them. You know, she shouldn't exist, but here she is. He says there was only the girl walking with him now her face bright as snow again comparing her to whiteness there that that righteousness that virtue her face was bright as snow in the moonlight and he knew she was working his questions around seeing the best answers that she could possibly give so they're talking and clarice is actually she's asking montague questions about himself and he's talking Mm -hmm. with her and she's actually listening to his questions and responding to his questions. You know what they're having here? They're having an actual authentic conversation to where people are interested in each other. They're interested in the person they're talking to and they're interested in what the other person has to say. And this is something that's completely new to Montauk. This is something they don't do in this society. Yeah, contrast this with his wife who's sitting there with the three screens all around her and she's got a script. Yeah, and the, the script, the yeah. Line, she's got her lines and she reads her lines with these fake people. Um, I think that's the contrast we see here, a, a mm-hmm. real conversation with, with actual physical human beings where you're thinking and you're, you're 
discovering things as right. opposed to reading from the script. Right, reading, yeah, reading the pre-formulated lines that have been you know, dedicated for you to read. And uh, so she answers here. She says, I like how she describes herself. She says, I'm 17 and I'm crazy. Mm-hmm. And that's what people have told her. You're crazy. You're not normal. You don't mm-hmm. fit in with society here. It's not society that's crazy, Clarice. It's you. When, like I said just mm-hmm. a few minutes ago, Clarice is the most normal character in this book and yeah, it's it's right. society that's crazy in this book yep. and then she says then she moves on isn't this a nice time to walk i like to smell things and look at things sometimes stay up all night walking and just watch the sunrise and i think the statement here indicates three things about clarice that are important others consider her to be crazy or insane She's not normal compared to society's standard. You know, she doesn't fit in. We talked about that. In spite of that, though, in spite of the fact that society kind of ostracizes her, she loves life. She loves interacting with reality. She loves interacting with the outdoors. She doesn't need to look at a screen. Why look at a screen when I can stay up all night and watch the sunrise? Yeah. Or when I, I, can, I can go smell these things. Or I, I can walk around and, and feel the wind and the breeze on my skin. And she is awake to the world around her. You know, others are, the, the rest of the people are sleepwalking through life. It's like they hardly ever leave their house. They, others, they're, they're sleepwalking. And they're uh, attaching themselves, like you mentioned, to things that aren't real. But not Clarice. She is wide awake. And she is interacting with reality, with the truth. She's in harmony and in tune with the truth. And this is what makes her a threat to this society here. I think that's exactly right. And what I would kind of like to trace is how does that link back up with the books? And I guess another question that I have for me to follow up on that is, do you think that when the story first started, had Montag already started stealing the books? Or do you think that he started stealing the books after he met Clarice? Oh, I think he already started... You you mean uh, hoarding the books in his house? Yes. I think he had already started doing it because you know how it is with everybody. This is off limits. Don't touch it. So what do people immediately want to focus their interest on? That mm-hmm. thing they were told to avoid. You know, most mm-hmm. people are, are like, even if they, oh, that's dangerous. But why? Why is that so dangerous? Yeah. I mean, look at Adam and Eve in the garden. Mm-hmm. All these trees are yours. Don't mess with that one. And the serpent says, "Eh, have you ever considered this tree? And they like, yeah, this, this one tree, you know, we got all these other trees, but no, they turned their focus on that one. And I think that's what Montag is doing here. He's because to, unless I've misunderstood, he has these books, but I don't know that he's really started reading them. Right. No, I I don't think he has read them at all. Um, Yeah. I think he's just hoarding them. He's writing them. Right. It's it's almost like he's doing something he doesn't even want to be doing. He doesn't understand why he's doing it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and I think Clarice is now, she's serving as this awakening here. And like like we mentioned earlier, books are a way of interacting with each other. And that's what this society wants people to not to do is not interact with each other. It, yeah. it, it dumbs you down and it makes you weak and it makes you easily easy to manipulate and to control. And, uh, yes, you know, this is uh, uh, Clarice isn't like everybody else. And, you know, they continued walking along. And finally she said, thoughtfully, Bradbury put, you know, I'm not afraid of you at all. And Montag asked, why should you be afraid? And she said, so many people are afraid of firemen. I mean, but you're just a man after all. And see, she doesn't see him as the fireman. She sees him as the man. Guy Montag, you're not the role that society has deemed for you. You are your own person. You are Guy Montag, and she sees beyond his role in society that he plays, and she sees him for who he truly is, or at least she's interested in getting past all that society nonsense and seeing this guy for who he truly is. I, I think that's right. Um, and it's, it's because she hasn't been, she hasn't been programmed 
in the way that she should have been, she, she sort of still has sort of the natural impulse. So she understands that something that seems to smell bad actually does smell bad because <laughs> she hasn't been taught that it, she hasn't been taught that bad is good. Right. And, uh, you know, and she says, I'm not afraid of you because I, I know who you are. You know, or I mean, I, I see that you're just a man. You're not some m- mythical monster. You're just a man who wears that uniform. And Bradbury writes of Montauk, says he saw himself in her eyes. So now he starts to see yes. himself in the way that Clarice sees him. And this is something that has never really been done before, I don't think. It says, suspended in two shining drops of bright water, himself dark and tiny, in, the fine, in fine detail, the lines about his mouth, everything there as if her eyes were two miraculous bits of violent amber that might capture and hold him intact. So Clarice here kind of keeps him from falling apart. You see so many, and we're going to get to this here later on, so many people are trying to kill themselves because they just can't stand the way the world is. But mm-hmm. Clarice here is bringing out she sees past all this nonsense and she's actually interested in who he is. And this is what holds him intact. This is what keeps him from either sliding off into just completely buying the lie that society's trying to sell him or, uh, you know, she's keeping him alive and, and she's bringing out that, that man that he truly is, you know, that, that man that, that, that has hoarded the books and he doesn't know why that, that man that's down in there and she's bringing him out. She's keeping him intact. You know, his, his, his integrity there intact. Her face turned to him. Now it was like fragile milk crystal with a soft and constant light around it. It was not the hysterical light of electricity. Again, not like a screen, but what, but the strangely comfortable and rare and gently flattering light of the candle so instead of comparing her face to an electric screen montag looks at her face now it's like a candle again and is that such such a surprise a fireman is going to see you know her face as a a little flame not this big bursting destructive flame but the flame of a candle and see there's a big difference between uh the flames that montag messes with to burn down houses a candle is not designed to burn down house. A candle is a controlled flame that's designed to do what, Evie? To Give, shed light. Shed light, to exactly. light up the room. Yes, exactly. And that's how he sees Clarice. He says, yeah. one, one time as a child and a power failure, his mother had discovered and lit a candle, and there had been a brief hour of rediscovery of such illumination that space lost its vast dimensions and drew comfortable around them. And they, mother and son, alone transformed, hoping that the power might not come on again too soon. So with, in the power outage, with all the electricity out, he and his mother have this moment of rediscovery, he says, when she lit a candle. And it was such an illumination that everything kind of disappeared around him. It was just them there in that moment. And it was comfortable. And they were transformed, and, and he actually hoped there for a while that the power wouldn't come back on. And because he enjoyed the realness and the authenticity of that moment, that's what a candle is. It's a small fire. You know, it's a natural light, not a manufactured light like a screen here. It fosters discovery, and like you sh- said, it sheds light in the room. And in this case, with the candle, fire led to change. And not just not change in destruction, but change in growth. And so, again, fire itself is not the problem. It's it's how we use the fire. Mm-hmm. And Montag is remembering what it was like to actually learn something here with his mother, to think for himself and to be human. So he's remembering those little moments of humanity. Clarice is lighting that fire, sparking that, kindling that little spark of humanity there within him. And that that's starting now to it starts off as a spark, but then it, it it grows as a fire inside him and actually consumes him. He's a completely different man at the end of this story. He's a completely different man at the end of this interaction with Clarice than that's he right. was just a few pages earlier. That's right. Well, what do you think is the significance of the fireman mainly going out at night? Because that's something I think Montag is is thinking about and wonders about. Well, why do, we, why do we start all these fires at night? And do you think that connects up to the, the little candle in the dark, and, which is a good thing versus going out and, and burning the house that's burning the books in That's the a good time and not during the day? 
That's a good question. I would think that my immediate reaction is it's a show. It's easier to see yeah. a fire at nighttime yes. and people will come out and watch it and it, it, it sends a message. This is what happens when you go against the rules. When you have books in your house, this is what happens. And that's why they do it at night because it's easier to see a fire at night than it is during the day. And plus, I think just the sheer surprise of it, just the sick, the sick entertainment you get from knocking in somebody's door in the middle of the night and completely shocking them and surprising and they don't know what's going on. Yeah. I, 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 that's what I, what do you think? Yeah. I, I think things that happen in the night, it, it adds to the sense of the terror. Mm -hmm. I, I think yes. you're absolutely yes. right that it, it makes it easier for everyone to see it. Um, it you're all, it's, you never know when the firemen may be arriving at your house at night, right? I mean, and that's what and that's, they want you to... also just a sense of unease. Yes, that, and that's how they want you to live. Yeah. They want you to live in unease, knowing that we could get you at any moment. But only, only if you actually have books. I mean, they want to keep everybody right. comfortable, but if you're right. on the right. wrong side of the law, we want you worried about that. Exactly. So you, you take like this nighttime scene with the mother and the candle, and this is homey comfort, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you have in this world is the exact opposite of that. Yes, yes, exactly. It's, instead of that motherly protection and comfort, it's living in this sense of fear that we can get you anytime we want to as soon as you step out of line or we think you've stepped out of line. Didn't they say that houses were fireproof? Didn't they, that firemen didn't start fires, that, that homes were fireproof, but the firemen come in and burn the houses down so they're not fireproof? You know, that's, that is important. Yeah, I hadn't thought through how that's... That is a contradiction. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't really developed. And I wonder if that's just a lie that, you yeah. know, government or whoever told people your houses are fireproof. The only reason we need firemen now is to destroy the books, but then they come in and burn people's houses down all the time. So people's houses clearly are not fireproof. I wonder if it's just kind of a, a, a nod, not like a nonverbal nod to that illusion of safety. Yeah, I guess that's right. And also because you, you've changed the role of the firemen from mm -hmm. people who put fires out. If, if you don't have people who put out fires, then you've got to, you have to pretend you don't need it. Right. So, yeah. so that's why it, it's covering over the actual need for a real fire. And Clarice asks Montag about being a fireman. And then she asks him, she says, do you ever read any of the books you burn? And he laughs. <laughs> In response, <laughs> that's against the law. And he laughs. You know, censorship is normality here. Yeah. It's perfectly acceptable social and governmental action to censor information. Because yeah, he, he just laughs it off. <laughs> that's, against, that's crazy. That's against the law. He continues. He says being a fireman is fine work. Monday, burn Millet. Wednesday, Whitman. Friday, Faulkner. Burn them to ashes, then burn the ashes. That's our official slogan. So he's repeating those talking points that he's been taught. You know, they burn books because it is easier to control people who don't know how to think. And that's what books facilitate. They facilitate thinking. And that's why people burn the books. And I mean, what, what do you think about Montag's attitude here? Burn the ashes, you know, burn the books to ashes and then burn the ashes. Well, the thing that strikes me is the way he's naming the author's names. And right. He's, he's like weirdly conversant in who, you know, major authors are in a way that I think many people actually aren't. And I'm wondering, is this, is this kind of a flaw in the book that Bradbury just isn't thinking through it? Like these, these firemen who've been forbidden to read, they're not going to know who the important authors are. Um, they're, they're just burning items. I think that's probably more realistic, but I think Bradbury wants to, I, I think that Bradbury wants that rhetoric of, you know, a Monday burn Malay. I think he likes the way that sounds. I think What's he alliteration? Writing. He likes the words and I think he can't help himself. But to me, I think it's a logical environment would be that conversant. I don't know. I think that, you know, Beatty read all these books. Yeah. I think this is something that Beatty probably said that Montag is just repeating. Oh, that's a good point. You're okay. Okay. I, I'm changing my mind because I think you're right about that. Because he it, seems, it sounds like baby when we hear him later. Because he says that's our official slogan. So somebody yeah. has taught me burn them to ashes, then burn the ashes. So I think he's just repeating. I don't know that he knows who Whitman is or Faulkner. You know, I don't think he, he knows that. And, and I don't think that at this point in the story, Montag is smart enough to do this alliteration 
Malay on Monday, Whitman Wednesday, Friday Faulkner. Yeah, I, I, he's not. I don't think he's intelligent enough at this point to start doing that. I think he heard it from. I Haiti. think I think he probably just reciting what he's heard there. That slogan that they teach people, and then Clarice, this we talked about man, erasing the past so that you can manipulate the present to control the future. Clarice asks Montag a question. She says, is it true that long ago firemen put out fires instead of going to start them? So by asking this question, she's obviously been hanging out with people who remember the past as it actually was, and they aren't afraid to speak of it. So Montag a answers Clarice, you know, with this, like we talked about, that regurgitated revisionist history. He says, no, house, here it is. Houses have always been fireproof. Take my word for it. So houses have always been, always been fireproof, even though they're burning them down. He just left from burning down a house. You know, so, and I think this, there, there are contradictions present here that if you just stop and think for a second, you could see the contradictions. But Montag yeah. doesn't stop and think, so you don't notice those contradictions. And Clarice replies, she's like, strange. I heard that once a long time ago, houses used to burn by accident and they needed firemen to stop the flames. Montag laughs again, just, this is preposterous. <laughs> because the truth sounds so ridiculous to him. This is not yeah. what he's been taught. It sounds ridiculous because this is not what he's been taught. That they, They've completely revised history. The authorities, they've completely erased history, any knowledge of it. That's why they erase the books too. Erase the past. Like I said, you can manipulate the present and control the future. So, I mean, what do you think? No, I, I think that's right. Um, but the fact that he has gotten to this point in life and has never put those things together, I mean, it, it shows you the, the, how much his, people's brains are being turned off. I mean, it, it takes a lot of work to make, to get people to the point that they don't think. Mm -hmm. and it makes you wonder what, what is the purpose behind that? Why are people being suppressed? What are they, what is the purpose for which they're being manipulated? Yeah. And, and then what we see, we never really get into that. And that's and the, we don't really, we don't really know. And I, maybe that's not the point in this particular dystopian book to get into the, the purpose behind the manipulation, because that's not, that's not the thing he's addressing. He's addressing the way that entertainment can be used or among many other things. In, in my book, this, this one here, this is the, the copy I had. I bought this one a while ago. In the back, there is an interview with Ray Bradbury, and they ask how his book compares to Orwell's 1984. Oh, and, right, in, yeah. and in short, he said, Orwell dealt more with the politics. My book yeah. deals more with the social aspect of it. Yeah. You know, so he doesn't really get into the whys. He just gets into this is how it is, and this is how it's affecting people. I think that's right. I mean, and I think those, those two worlds are, I mean, th those could be the same dystopia. Mm -hmm. Very possibly the same. I mean, we those could be just two different stories happening within the same dystopia. I don't think they are, but I mean, it's it's a similar concept in 1984. Like, yeah. they they mentioned they do have books, but they're like actually factory produced mm -hmm. romance novels that follow a certain formula. It's it's the entertainment we want you to have that right. isn't going to that isn't it's social to programming. Anything. Yes, entertainment as social programming, which is what you see a lot today. Yes. But I guess what, what reminds me of in, in 1984 is just the wars being started and the people mm -hmm. having really no idea of the cause, causes behind it. It's the same kind of thing going on here. Right. And we mentioned Montag laughing at how absurd some of Clarice's questions and, and her answers are. And she kind of gets on to him a little bit. She says, you laugh when I haven't been funny and you answer right off. You never stop to think what I've asked you. So mm -hmm. no, everything's so fast. No time to stop and think and consider just regurgitate the talking points that you've been taught laugh at the silliness of those ideas that go against the narrative and yeah. montag again he he has no answer for this he just calls clarice odd he and then he chides her for not having any respect you know as if it's disrespectful to ask questions you know i wouldn't say she's being disrespectful here at all she's having a conversation with a man and that's what conversations are you ask questions you get answers and you figure stuff out and uh, he's calling her disrespectful simply because she seems to be asking questions that she shouldn't be asking, you know? Well, she is kind of challenging him, though. I mean, it's not the usual dynamic. She is. With a teenage girl and a grown man, but it's because he, it, his mind is childish in a lot of ways. Yeah. Been, you know. <laughs> That's exactly right. She, uh, he, he, he taps the numerals 451 that is stitched, I'm sorry, on his, on his sleeve here. He taps those numbers. And uh, that's a bit of intimidation. That's an intimidation tactic, I, I think. You know, 
there are consequences for this type of behavior, Clarice. You know, mm -hmm. look at this right here. Yeah. And then she changes this, and, and that's that's what the government does. That's what that's what government official stooges do. They just point to their little badge of authority and act like, hey, you better knock this off because I'm just a stooge and I'm going to do what I'm told. Clarice again changes the subject, and and it, I thought it was funny here. It's like in her mind, uh, this is putting him at unease. I I should probably stop talking about what I want to talk about and start asking more socially acceptable questions. And then she starts asking him, have you ever watched the jet cars? She goes on to talk about how the drivers are going in circles and they're going so fast. It's like, I better change the topic to something generic. So not to tick anybody off. Have you, have you seen the jet cars? What do you think about the jet cars? Everybody's going so fast, but then she can't help herself. She says, everybody's going so fast. They don't take the time to consider, to observe, to think and assess. And then she says, they don't know what grass is or, or flowers because they never see them slowly. All they see are blur. All they see is blurs of color. And this is a lot of people. This is, and I, I want to take it back to the, the, the preacher man coming out in me here. This is a problem a lot of people have when they're reading the Bible. I've noticed they don't slow down and focus on the words that are there in front of them. They just kind of read it quickly. Mm -hmm. And they don't stop and think, and this, look, look what's happening in this one verse. Uh, look at this word. What does this word mean? What is the context here? And you get a lot of people who read the Bible the way Clarice, Clarice is talking about the jet cars. All they just see is blurs. They don't really stop and think and consider and observe and, and assess. And that's just as a pastor, that really doesn't fit into what we're talking. I'm shoehorning that point in, but uh, we can move on. But I've just noticed that when people read the Bible, that's how a lot of people tend to read the Bible, just as a blur, just to say they did it, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think a lot of people read almost everything that way. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think we, we do live in a society that has some similarities here, which we're constantly surrounded by entertainment, and we all have kind of a limited attention span. Like, I see it myself that... Um, because because there's always one you know something novel to look at here you know mm -hmm. it's, it makes it harder for us to focus on one thing so I, I think that we you know our society we can relate to that point a lot because we have kind of lost the ability to focus on something either either whether it's a book or whether it's nature that's in front of us because there's always something bright and shiny and new to look at in the corners it's it's one thing after another yeah and you get to go in so fast. You, you right. get, you just go, when you go so fast, you end up just going through the motions because you right. don't have time to really stop and savor those moments. Right. And everybody's lives are so busy. You're always here. You always got to be here. You always got to be there. And I think we miss out on a lot of those little moments in life that you'll never get back. Those moments yeah. with your kids that you'll never get back. Those moments with your spouse that you'll never get back. And when you're just going so fast, you don't have time to stop and think and be thankful and enjoy, which I mean, there, God wants us. He gave us, Jesus said, I came to give life so you can have life abundantly. I want you to enjoy life. This earth is a tough place, but there's a lot of beauty here. It's meant to be enjoyed in Ecclesiastes, which is what is you know, brought up frequently in this book. You know, the author, the, the, the preacher there in Ecclesiastes says, enjoy your life is short so enjoy the good moments when you got them because it's all vanity it's all vapor it's here and it's it's gone so while you got something good enjoy it don't just speed past everything and yeah. speaking of speeding clarice mentioned something funny here she says that her uncle was jailed for two days evie for driving 40 miles an hour that was a prison worthy offense for two days for going mm -hmm. too slow and i was trying to think what that sounds absurd that sounds almost comedic but why this means something why is it in there this is the government's way of discouraging the thought process the process of thinking the speed keeps people distracted go faster go faster don't pay attention Focus on not killing yourself. You, got, you don't have time to focus on anything else. You're going so fast. But when you slow down and smell the roses, 
you actually have time to stop and think. And the government putting a man in jail for going too slow. And uh, this is this is why I think that absurd uh, punishment happened. What do you think about it? Am I, am I reading too much into it? I, I don't think so. What do you think? No, I, I think everything they're saying is there. And I think there was something more, which is that this is a society that's very, um, that disregards safety. People are frequently killed mm-hmm. in car accidents, run over. I mean, yeah. all this speed is not safe. And I think that's part of the intention, which is to desensitize people to death. That's exactly right. right. And, 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 and it's easier to manipulate them into going to war or doing whatever you want them to do. Right. And it encourages them not to think. And that's yes, what Mont- I think it's both of those things working together. And that's what Montag tells Clarice here immediately. He says, you think too many things. He said that in Bradbury said he says it with a sense of unease. Yeah. This, you, you, you think too much. And that made him, why would that make a man uneasy? I, I would think two reasons here. Self-consciousness. She's smarter than me. I can't keep up, but I don't think that's it here. No. I think in this society here, He's uneasy because this is how people get in trouble. Yes. By thinking. You think too much. Uh, this, uh, I, feel, I feel like something could just jump out and get me here. Somebody might be listening, you know. And that's what I think Montag is nervous about. He's afraid he'll get in trouble. And I think he, he's also nervous. He doesn't know how to do it. He doesn't know how to think. And he, he's out mm-hmm. of his... He's out of his element here. He feels a you know, 17 year old girl is smarter than me. And that's what, that's what I, I, I think the unease comes from. Because I, I think as we were saying earlier, he knows on some level that this programming is wrong. I mean, there, there's mm-hmm. that tension within him and the tension in his wife between what they, what they were aware they think or what they think they think. And at some, you know, in some level, what they know to be actually true um, it, it's there's that discord and I, I think Clarice is, is bringing that out I think that's part of why he's uneasy too because what he's tried to suppress is coming to the surface and you you said something that reminded me what he's been taught has been wrong and yeah. that's how you you spot the lie a lie no matter how intricately it's been woven there will necessarily be a contradiction in there somewhere yeah and, and we talked about that when we were talking about Fire, houses are fireproof, but yet firemen can come burn them down with the books. So how are they fireproof? You see, that's a contradiction there yeah. because it's that, and there's the contradiction in the lie. The lie, that's what makes them lies. They don't always match up. There, there's a contradiction and, 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 and that's what thinking will do for you. When you stop and think, you'll be able to spot those contradictions. But if you don't have time to stop and think, those contradictions just kind of slide by unnoticed and people just go on with their normal lives. And that's why going too slow is outlawed because if you go too slow, you'll spot those contradictions and you'll see the lie. And then you'll see it, it will, that, 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 that uh, castle of cards will all just come tumbling down and then you'll see the truth. You'll see like the wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtain, you know, and yeah. uh, that's why they don't want him to, to think. And that's why Montag is, is so uncomfortable thinking. Clarice, mm-hmm. she then goes on. She brings up the parlor walls, you know, the screens, the 200-foot-long billboards. Now, I thought this was funny. Mm-hmm. There, people are going so fast. If you're going so fast, how can you have time to read a billboard? Mm-hmm. But advertisements have adapted to this speeding culture. They're 200 foot long billboards. They used to be only 20 feet long, Clarice said. And Montag said, I didn't know this because <laughs> he didn't know it because he hadn't been taught that. Don't learn but, history. Yeah, but I, I thought it's funny. Well, advertisements have to be there. So mm-hmm. people are going so fast. We just got to make the billboards bigger. 10 times yeah. bigger, you know, so people can see those advertisements, you know, so they still, I just thought that was kind of a funny touch there. Um, and then she says, I rarely watch parlor walls or go to races or go to fun parks. So I've got lots of time for crazy thoughts. Mm-hmm. And that's Clarice. I'm going to spend my time stopping to think. And rather than not that these other things are bad, it just in, inherently in and of themselves, I just choose not to be distracted. And that's what yeah. these people get so distracted. Nothing wrong with sports. Nothing wrong with fun parks. 
nothing morally wrong with that. No, not at all. But when they become distractions and they, mm-hmm. they, they become, they, 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 they canker your list of priorities there, your rankings of priorities, you know, they, they throw your priorities out of whack, then they become problems. And that's what's going on here. There's plenty of time to think, like Clarice said, when you're not oppressed by distractions. And I think our society today is oppressed, Evie, by distractions. We have attention spans that don't last. They're the, the attention span of a gnat, you know? I mean, there's just... It's terrible. Nobody has, an, nobody has attention spans at all. Yeah. And, and, and you sit down, and I do this myself sometimes. And, yeah. the bad, and, and the bad thing, I feel bad about it, but then I feel good about it because I'm at least aware that I'm trying to do this. And so I try to put right. a stop to it, you know? I'll be sitting there reading a book, and maybe I'd put a picture or something up on Facebook or something. And I'll be sitting there reading a book and I'll do it for about five minutes, maybe. And then mm-hmm. I'll think, I wonder if anybody's commented on my picture on Facebook. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, Has anybody yeah. liked my tweet? Has anybody yeah. liked my tweet? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good reason to put this book down. And, and then you're not going to just go look at what somebody said about your thing on Facebook. You're then going to start scrolling through Facebook. Oh, well, this is new. Oh, well, this is new. Yeah. And, and, and I, mean, I'd, I want to do that too. I'm not high and mighty. I'm not some angel. I live in this society just like everybody else. Right. I'm, I'm oppressed by the same temptations as everybody else. I mean, I know I am. But yeah. I, and sometimes I give in to that. Well, no. Yeah. I, and, and, I'm, and sometimes I make the choice. You know, you're falling for that. No, but this, this Facebook post was important. The, the, the world could not survive without this Facebook post that I put on there. I need to see who replied to it. Uh, this, I put this book down and check. But here lately, I've said, you know what? The, it's, it's off. I'm not looking on this dumb stuff anymore. Not say yes. dumb stuff. I mean, it, Facebook is a, I mean, it, it's not an evil thing. It's just, it's, it's very easy to get distracted by it though. Well, and it's, it's literally addictive. I mean, it is. No, it, it, you're exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And so, I mean, if you can use it sort of in moderation, it can be a good thing, but it's, right. um, yeah. And it, it's just like anything else. The sweets, I'm going to allow myself one cookie and that's it. I'm not going to mm-hmm. eat 15 cookies. I want to eat 15 mm-hmm. cookies, but I'm not. I just have one and I'll be done with it. I'm, I've looked on Facebook. Let's say I've spent 30 minutes on Facebook total today. I think that's enough. So I'm going to yes. put it up. I don't, there's nothing else I need to know about right now, but that's what people they're, they're, they're giving into these distractions here. Because there's book, always something happening. There's you know, like, always you've something got to check new because there is, it, it's not the case like, Oh, well, every morning you'll get your newspaper. It's right. like constantly. There's some, there's, you know, you go, you go to Twitter and five minutes from now, there's going to be new tweets for you to look at. Well, it's going to be the same old stuff, but, I mean, if you're not able to concentrate, there's certain types of books you can read in five minute segments, but there's some books, if you can only read five minutes at a time, you just can't read that book because you're never going to be focused enough on what it's saying. It'll take you a year to read that book. If you only, well, whatever you, you book it might read be. read it at all because it takes like a, a total concentration. And if you're reading and like on the back of your mind, you're thinking about, well, I wonder what, what's going on here. I wonder what's going on in the news. Maybe I should just check the news. You're, you're not getting anything out of it. You know, you know what I mean? Like it, like really books that really require concentration. Yeah. If you're thinking about something else, you're, you've got the phone next to you, it's lighting up. Um, you're, you're not able to read them at all. And I, I just think that's unfortunate because um, I, I want to read serious books. I, I want to think serious thoughts. And it, you know, I think it's a struggle for everybody to, to focus on the things that are really going to be beneficial to us. Right. Exactly. And, and that's a big problem with our society today is that, we are being easily manipulated because right. uh, we, and we're, we're, we're contributing to that. Yeah. I, nobody forces me to pick up my, my Kindle or my phone and look at it. Yeah. No, nobody forces me to do that. I make the choice to do that because there are times when I get mentally lazy and that's my fault. And I realize I've got to be stronger than this. I've got to be better than I'm, I'm not going to be an, an idiot who can't think, who can't concentrate on something for longer than five minutes or whatever. And you can't interact with other people because there's a phone around. Right. And, and that's why when I'm, when I'm interacting with people, I make the special point to, to put my phone down unless 
and, and the only way, like if my wife's out or something mm -hmm. and, and she calls me, that's the only person that I will interrupt a conversation for. Because if my mm -hmm. wife knows I'm with somebody and she calls, then there's something I need to know that's going on, you know. But right. other than that, I, 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 it makes people feel more valuable to you when you put the phone aside and, and, and it's not even part of the equation anymore. And that's a big problem with our society too. I read a book, it's been a while ago, called Alone Together. Oh, right. We're all so connect, connected, you know, through Facebook yeah. or through social media, but we're, we're so alone. I remember seeing one time, this has been years ago. I was in, in uh, Texas, at a seminary in Texas, and this family walked in. We were eating at Raising Cane's, and we walked in. It was me and Amanda and Lex and Brooks, and Brooks was a toddler, and this family walked in, this family of three, they placed their order, and I just happened to watch them. They came and sat down. It was in one of those, it's a booth. Part of it is a booth that goes long, and then it's got little tables in front of the booth, you know? And they all sat side by side to each other. So they're not across from each other looking at each other. They're all side by side, the husband, the wife, and the boy who was probably about 10 or 11. And what do they do? They all sit there. And instead of talking to each other while they wait for their food to come out, they get out the phones and they all just sitting there doing this. So they're sitting there together side by side, but they might as well not even be there because they're not interacting with each other. Yeah. And, and that's what's going on here in this novel. Yes. They are trying to get people to not interact with each other because when people interact with each other, they exchange ideas. They speak mm -hmm. and they exchange ideas. And when people start thinking together, that's when you can spot those contradictions. That's when you mm -hmm. can spot the, the lie. And then you can more, the, the truth comes more into focus when you start thinking together, that iron starts sharpening iron. And that's what Clarice is getting at here. She wants to interact with people. And then after this interaction with Clarice, Montag realizes, I want to interact with people too. Uh, but but yeah. yeah, so that kind of burn lights that fire within him as well, and yeah, you know, Clarice mentions other stuff here. I'm going to kind of skip through it. She just talks about observing reality, using your senses to observe reality. Put the screens, put the, he called them seashells back then, but I Evie, mean, these things didn't exist back in the day, back in '53. Mm -hmm. But this is exactly what Ray Bradbury was talking about here these earbuds when he would talk about those mm -hmm. seashells that were pushed directly into Mildred's ears, just like these are into mine. This is exactly what he was talking about. So the man was right. a bit of a prophet in that way. And uh, Clarice it's says, It's worse than he imagined though. Oh, it is. It absolutely is. But uh, here, here we are. The man, you know, he was on, he was on that right path, you know? Mm -hmm. And then Clarice tells Montauk, she says, if you look, and then she looks up at the sky, she says, if you look, if you take the time to look, there's a man in the moon. If you look mm -hmm. uh, at the, the dew on the grass, and uh, Montag couldn't remember what dew on the grass was because he never stopped to take a look at it. And he got kind of irritated because he didn't know what she was talking about. And then she says, and if you just look, there's a man in the moon. You're kind of that, that romantic uh, imagination starts to run wild. And then Bradbury writes this here, Montag hadn't looked for a long time he had no observation. He had no grasp on the truth because he did not interact with reality in the way that Clarice did. And here's what I want to kind of focus on here. We can close with this here. Knowledge begins with observation. Sense perception. And you take what you perceive with your senses, you observe reality, and then you start putting pieces together and you form concepts. And you start thinking conceptually. And that's higher level thinking that only humans on this earth can do. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe spiritual creatures like angels and stuff can do that. I would think they could. They, they seem to be intelligent. But I know that dogs can't do that. You know? So, so right. human here, life here on this earth, humans are the only ones who can think conceptually. And the senses are instruments that God gave us to provide a knowledge of reality. He put reality there. And he said, I'm going to give you these senses and you can 
see the truth for yourself. And that's what makes it real. That's why it's called reality. And uh, Leonard Peikoff, who's an, an objectivist, uh, he was a, one of, a student of Ayn Rand. He says, the senses respond to reality. Reality acts on the senses. And the senses then respond to reality. The senses don't respond. I'm, I'm quoting him here. The senses do not respond to a zero, only to a something, something real, some existential object which acts on them. And that's what, Clar that's what Clarice has done here to Montauk. She has acted on him and he has interacted with her. And she has all the stuff, like we talked about, all the stuff in the books. She has made that concrete here in the real world. And, and she's interacted with Montag and he, he's changed now because he's interacted with reality. And the senses, uh, the senses don't interpret, Peikoff goes on to say. The senses don't analyze. They merely respond you know, to, to the stimuli. And they, they make us aware that something has acted on us. The senses report the stimuli and it's the mind that interprets and analyzes and, and ties it together and conceptualizes. That's called the thinking process. And when people are, are so distracted that they don't have time to interact with reality, they, they don't have time to see the truth and then to stop and think about it. They're just like that hamster in the wheel in its cage. That's, he's running his butt off, but he's going nowhere. He's just running in that wheel. And, and this is what the senses do. And that's why Ray Bradbury, he's put such a, an emphasis on the senses here with Clarice. The smells. If you just look, you can feel the wind. Uh, you know, she, the sight, sense, touch. She hasn't tasted anything yet, even though she's mentioned uh, apricots and, and, and uh, strawberries. But see, she's... she's utilizing her senses to interact with reality and and everybody else is just going so fast that they don't have the time to do that and she's the one who actually has a grasp on the real world here and and that's what man he perceives reality directly it impacts his sensory organs and and that kickstarts the learning process it begins with that sensory data. And then you perform a rigorous intellectual or spiritual, however you want to refer to it, process of organizing that data into concepts. And because you and me have read this book carefully, we've spotted a contradiction already. Houses are fireproof, but firemen burn down the houses. If we were just reading along and we didn't stop and remember and tie these threads together... Uh, you wouldn't have realized that. And that's, that's what we talked about. That's why, that's why the government here in this, in this story has been able to pull the wool over people's eyes because people are going so fast, they don't have time to stop and think and notice what's real and notice the contradictions and notice what's wrong. Well, what do you think about that? You know, I think that's right. And I guess what I'm thinking of, there is so much emphasis on the senses and reality. And then, but all, all the time we think about this book, Fahrenheit 451, about, as being about book burning, basically, that mm -hmm. you want to get rid of all the books. It all, it, you could argue, well, books are escapists. You know, books are to help disconnect you from reality. Um, and I guess maybe I'm making the, the point that I'm asking about, which is books are maybe another way that we get plugged into reality. Or maybe the books, books help us to help awaken us to reality. I, I, don't, I don't know, but I think it's... I think it does have to do with encountering another person's mind yes. in a way. Um, but those seem to be disparate concepts. I think they tie in together. I'm kind of trying to explain how I think they do, but I, that, that's interesting to me, the sort of the body being present in reality and the senses taking in real information about what is actually there, not what's been manufactured. And then that being paired with, an emphasis on on books, which is is not exactly the same thing. I think, you know what I mean. I think those things mm -hmm. all are complementary, but it's not totally obvious how those fit together. I think the as well, and we can get through this as we go through the story in in future episodes. But I think just to briefly answer your question, 
when I read a book, I like to, you, your mind has to imagine the setting. And yes. th th this is how I read it. This is how I remember. I, I don't want to read a book just to read words on a page. I want to visualize it in my mind. I have to see it in my mind. And I like to, and you can laugh at this, this, this is how I do it. I like to imagine actors in roles reading this. Now, way back when, when the first time I read this, which I don't remember how long ago that's been, now, for whatever reason, I just got a young Bruce Willis as Montag in this story, and I got that a young I got a young Scarlett Johansson as Clarice. Mm -hmm. I got uh, Tommy Lee Jones as Beatty, mm -hmm. and uh, Christopher Lee as Faber. Yeah, you, you know, it, it, you could yeah. see, and you but see that's how I imagined it. Now you can mm -hmm. imagine it somewhat completely different. Maybe you got Matt Damon. Maybe you got I don't know somebody else. Yeah, whoever. But I but see it activates your mind when you read a book. See, when you're looking at a screen, the, the, the screen is doing all that work for you. The background right. is already set. The, what the people look like is already set. Uh, they're, they're just feeding that to you. But when you're reading a book, my, my mind is actually developing this stuff. I, I remember Christopher Nolan said this one time, and it was on a, uh, uh, about the movie Inception, you know, with Leonardo DiCaprio with the dreams. And everything. Have you ever seen that movie? I haven't seen it. I, I do know. It's, it's an ex about. excellent movie. Mm -hmm. And he said, he pointed out something that I thought was fascinating. He said, when you dream, your mind creates the background. If you're in a kitchen that has green tiles and it may have purple curtains or whatever, your mind, may, it, it creates all of that. It, the, the smallest background information, your mind is creating that. Yeah. And I, I just thought that was fascinating, yeah. fascinating that the mind could do that. And when I'm reading, I, it, it's, it's really a mental workout with me when I read because I don't want to just read the book to say I've read it. I want to experience, like Ayn Rand said, and I know I keep bringing her up, but like Ayn Rand said, I agree with a lot of what she said. A lot, now just to be clear, a lot of what Ayn Rand said was 100% correct. A lot of what she said was 100% wrong. And I'm aware of that. You know, so mm -hmm. I don't, don't think I'm some, you know, whatever Ayn Rand says is gospel. I just have been reading her a lot lately, and I, I like a lot of what she says. But some of it. Because she, she's an interesting person to react against or she towards. Is. I mean, I mean she, someone like that who presents certain ideas, you're going to find yourself. I mean, and I, I don't find her world appealing um, at all. But at the same time, you have to think, well, what is there in, what is in this that I'm reacting to? And you learn something, you know? To me, she's one of those people, and I don't want to make this about Ayn Rand. Imagine a baseball player. She's either going to knock a 500-foot home run or she's going to strike out hard. You know what I'm saying? That's what I think about her. Some of her stuff on abortion and some of her stuff on atheism, it is a hard and brutal strikeout. It's just flat out right. wrong, and contradictions are all over the place. Mm -hmm. But on other stuff, she smacked a 500-foot home run over the wall. That, that ball had a motor on it. You know, some of the stuff she says is just right. It's just right. And, and so don't get me wrong when I quote Ayn Rand. I don't agree with everything she says. But the stuff that she says I do agree with, I really agree with it. And the stuff she says I disagree with, I really disagree with it. But that being yeah, said. Yeah, I, I figured that was the case. I mean, but what's interesting to me is hardly anybody's 100% wrong. I mean, you look at people. Right. It's almost like the people who have, who are the most wrong about one thing, um, they're starting at a place of truth, like heresies are where you take mm -hmm. something that's true and you take it further than it should go, right? Mm -hmm. Like you look at Christological heresies where you, it'll be there like Jesus was all man or Jesus was all God. And you're not, it's not living with like tension with um, paradox. You know, I think that's a lot of, a lot of times the worst errors are the ones that are rooted in something that's true, but it's isolated from other things that are also true. That, that, and that's why it's so important to interact with books. And people that you might not necessarily agree 100% with. Yes. You can get good, something true, even if it's something small out of pretty much everything you can read. And then it, you, you can see why this other stuff is wrong. And see, that is almost as important as learning, as acquiring knowledge, is learning why this particular point is false. Here's the hole in it. You know, that's just Absolutely. as important. So you don't fall for that. And you can counteract that. And... uh 
But one thing about Ayn Rand and objectivism here, you know, Peikoff, uh, when he wrote his book, uh, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, and I'm, I'm reading that book right now, he said that men's basic freedom is to set his conceptual faculty, his mind in motion, or to choose not to do it. You know, in short, to, to, think, to think or not to think. That's, yeah. that's mankind's freedom. And, and, and one thing that Ayn Rand said in uh, The Virtue of Selfishness, she said, every man is free to make bad decisions, but nobody is free to succeed by making bad decisions. You see what I'm saying? That's an interesting, that, yeah, that's an interesting point. I and think reality is a certain thing, and you, you are, your mind can pretend that it isn't, but when you act in accordance with the lie, it's going to produce results that aren't what you think are going to come about. Now, you're free to make whatever choice you want to make, but you're not going to succeed by, you're not free to find success in every choice you make. When you make wrong choices, you're, you're going to fail, and that's reality. If I try to live underwater, I'm going to drown because I'm not a fish and that's reality. So nothing I can do about that, you know? And I mean, in important sense, you're not free to live underwater. You're yeah. You're not free to succeed by making bad choices. That's and, not, and, and it, I would also say, I think you have to kind of back out from these kind of thinkers discussion of what freedom is and freedom is not necessarily just licensed to do what you want. Freedom right. Is, freedom is the power to act in accordance with reality. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's and, what, and that's what real freedom is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's true. And that's and to bring it back to Fahrenheit 451 here, because this is where it ties in. That's why in. this society isn't free, because people are not able to act in accordance with what they actually know to be true. That's right. They are fed a lie, and either and, and people and and they're fed the lie because they're eating it. They're 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 not. They're choosing not to think. Right. They're trying to Clar see. Clarice has been fed this lie too, but she rejects it. Mm -hmm. But that's with the choice to think or not to think. To focus your consciousness on the world around you or not. And, and, and uh, Peikoff says that a mind, a man must commit himself to a course of self conscious mental action, a mind committed to full awareness. If you want to succeed in the world, you want to actually live the life that man is supposed to live, you always have to be thinking. You have to, have, you have to be committed, fully committed to having a mind that is aware. You can never shut your mind off, you know, even if I'm reading this book and I read this book for uh, uh, leisure yeah. and, and to learn. And I, th I think that there's, there's a true leisure. You can always find something to learn from even in true leisure, you know, leisure is, I, I never just shut my mind off and just, just take whatever the TV feeds me or whatever. I'm constantly processing and, and learning something. And, and, well, and, and I think that's part of what this book is about is that yes. sitting mindlessly is not leisure at all. Ex 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 leisure, ex leisure is what you do because it's good in itself. Right, right. It's healthy for you. It, it's a thing that you choose to do not because it produces some effect or produces money or whatever. Right. That's what true leisure is. And I think that's mentioned in this book. That, and, and where I'm getting this concept from is, is a writer called Joseph Keeper who wrote a book called Leisure, the Basis of Culture. Mm -hmm. And it goes into great detail about this that leisure is more important than necessarily what we produce because leisure is the thing that we do for its own end. Like for, for worship is the ultimate leisure because it, 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 you're not doing it for some other purpose. You're doing it for itself. Right? It's, it recharges you. Right. It, uh, it helps you. Well, no, but see, that's clarity. not what he's saying. That's not leisure. is not something you do to be recharged. So you can go back to work. Leisure is the thing that you do because it is valuable. Oh, I see. I see. Yes. And one thing, uh, yeah, and, and that, but leisure has become a way of life for these people. That, see, they're just... Well, this, it, it, that's just the thing. It's not leisure. And that's, 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 that's right, right, right. Yeah, that leisure. People have no leisure right, because right. they're constantly being fed this entertainment that numbs them. And they if have they, no actual leisure. If they had true leisure, they wouldn't be trying to kill themselves. They would think. The problem with leisure is that it's thinking, contemplating. Right, right, right. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yes. And uh, Peikoff says here, a, a passive mind. Leonard Peikoff. Yes. A passive mind. An unfocused mind is a mind that's drifting, it's dazed, it's oblivious to considerations like truth, clarity, context, or methodology, you know, how things work. It merely experiences random stimuli, either outer stimuli or inner stimuli, without self-awareness, without continuity, and without purpose. And this is Montag's mindset 
as well as most of the people's mindset here at the beginning of the story. They've got a passive and unfocused mind. And that's what you, yes. you mentioned, how do books play into this? Books demand, they require deliberate, sustained focus, a well-trained mind, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. It demands, this process of reading a book d demands a well-trained mind, one that is capable of independent thought, of interacting with the book, like we've been talking about, of taking an active role. To me, reading a book is not a passive experience. It is an interactive experience. You imagine the characters. You know, you imagine the setting. You, you, you feel their emotions. You, you, you analyze the themes. You tie the plot points together. All this fun stuff about reading a story. You know, that's what a book is an interactive process. That's why uh, I read a book. And, and sometimes if it's a really good book, I, I, I like to read before I go to bed. And sometimes I'm so charged up reading the book that I, I, I don't want to fall asleep. Yeah, because I'm so charged yeah. up reading the book. And then sometimes I read a book and I'm just so mentally exhausted that I want to sleep now because yeah. I've, I've, I've spent you know, the, this, this intellectual uh, exercise here of interacting with this book has worn me out. And that's why Clarice, the, 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 and one last thing here, the printed word, it demands analysis, wouldn't you say? Like if I say something, yeah. if I say something, maybe I spoke without thinking or maybe I, I, I hyperbole or something like that. But if I took the time to write a word down and not go back and erase it, but I chose that word specifically, it's easy to go back and look at something in print and analyze it. And ideally, those words in print should be chosen carefully. You should choose those words on purpose after much thought and much deliberation. And that's why I think that reading books facilitates thought more than, than just watching a movie or, or, or listening to a podcast or something. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. And to me, the big difference with, um, to me, the big difference if you are watching a movie or television you can intellect, intellectually interact with it. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can get something from it. And I think that Bradbury says exactly that. You could have a television show or a movie or a play that you learn something from. But what you get from a book that you do not get from a movie is you can actually experience what it's like to be a different person. Mm -hmm. I mean, you come away from these experiences in books and at their best, it's like it really happened to you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And uh, I've, I never, I've never seen a movie where I feel like that was part of the life experience that I had because with, with a book, it's a sustained time that your mind is spending in this other character's experience. And it, I think it does give you a better ability with people that you interact with to realize everybody has their own story that's going on their own perspective, but it, it's time outside of your own mind, your own perspective. And it's sustained. It's time to, yes. ex it's, it's long enough to explore. It takes to, hours to, to read a book. To go just, more in hours. depth. That's why I, you, I, I like the graphic novel Watchmen. I, I, you mm -hmm. know, I'm not saying it's the greatest thing. There's some things about it that I, I, I don't like, but I like that movie. I like that story. It's a, it's a well-told story for what it is. Then Zack Snyder goes and makes a movie about it and changes up the ending. And, they left out so much stuff. The movie just inherently is weaker because they tried to cram all of this into two hours. And you left out these little details, these little layers that really add to the story. You know, and, and, and there are a lot of movies and books like that. And I, it's, it's just, it's like you said, that word sustained. That's an exact, that's, that's a, that's a correct word you have time to dig in and really interact and stop and think if you need to. You're not just moving from scene to scene in a movie. I mean, I guess you could pause it if you wanted to, but with a book, you have time to go back and kind of read it again and actually stop and think. And uh, thinking is, for Montag here, thinking is an uncomfortable process. And I think, for, I think thinking is, is kind of like exercising for, for people in general. It's, it's uncomfortable. I've, I've started going back to the gym and I started some, watching some of these old Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, workout videos. You know, he was Mr. Olympia. He was obviously, you know, a bodybuilder before he got into uh, acting. And he would say, you, you punish the muscles. You know, you, you, you make your muscles scream in agony and that's good because they're being torn down so that they can be built up stronger. 
Yeah, you know, and that's the mindset you have to have going in because some people, I don't want to work out because it's uncomfortable, but some people go in, I, I like that uncomfortable, my muscles are burning, it's, it's painful, but that's yeah. that weakness leaving and I know it's getting stronger now. And thinking is a lot like that. It's an un- it can be an uncomfortable process. This whole thing with Montag, conviction is mm-hmm. an uncomfortable process. He's uncomfortable here. Uh, yeah, he, they, they walked along in silence there for a while, Montag and Clarice did. Her silence was thoughtful. His was a kind of clenching and uncomfortable silence in which, in which he shot her accusing glances. So he was kind of mad at her for making him think and for making him realize uh, maybe things aren't exactly the way I thought they were. Maybe I'm not as good a guy as I thought I am. Oh, oh no, this conviction here. It's, oh, I don't like this feeling. Mm -hmm. And thinking is uncomfortable. Conviction is uncomfortable. When somebody hears an inconvenient truth, especially about themselves, they bristle up and they get defensive and touchy Mm -hmm. because the truth has brought to light a flaw that they've either been hiding or a flaw that they didn't know they had. And nobody, Evie, likes to be criticized. I don't care what anybody says. Nobody likes to be criticized. But you know what? Truth doesn't care. Right. The truth I mean, is you what can, it is. You can learn to appreciate what you're getting out you of can, it. You can, yes. Everybody, like really enjoys it. And that's what you've got, like Arnold Schwarzenegger said, you've got to come to love the feeling of that muscle pain because that's yeah. weakness leaving and that's strength growing. And nobody i don't like it when i'm sitting there doing calf raises and my calves are burning i hate that feeling but i press on because i want to have stronger calves you know i want to be in good shape and i don't like being criticized but i don't like that burning feeling in my spirit but that 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 sense of conviction but i i want that flaw to be gone i want that weakness to be gone so that the the man of integrity can can burst forth even stronger and it's an uncomfortable, and Montag is experiencing that here. This is all uncomfortable. And we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this up real quick. They get to Clarice's house. It's all lit up. So all these other houses are dark. You know why? Because right. they're watching screens. What do you do when you watch TV? You turn the lights off, you, usually, right? But Clarice's house is all lit up. Montag said he'd never seen that many house lights before. And the lights aren't off because they're not watching screens. They're on because people are in there, they, they're, they're looking at each other, they can see each other, and they're interacting with each other. And probably on the sly, they might be reading some books in there too, in Clarice's mm-hmm. house. This is, they never say that, but you always suspect. Right, 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 exactly. And see, they're interacting with each other. They're talking with each other. And uh, this is symbolic, Clarice's house is symbolic of uh, that family. This family is alive. It's bright, it's alive, it's shining, when all the mm-hmm. other houses are dead. You know, they're, they're in Clarice's house, their spirits are vibrant among a neighborhood of ghosts, you know, and Clarice and her father, her mother, her uncle, they're sitting around and they're talking to each other. And I remember Montag said, what do you talk about? Like sitting down and talking extended conversation. What, what do you have to talk about? Because that's completely foreign to him because he and his wife don't do it. And uh, you know, it's just, it's just, he doesn't know what, what do you, what do you mean? You sit around and talk and Cl- Clarice, she, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's foreign to him. Montag's married, but like, like I mentioned earlier, the name of that book, he and his wife are alone together. They, they don't talk. They don't interact. It's not a real authentic relationship. And Clarice doesn't answer his question. What do you talk about? And she just tells him good night. And then she asks him a, a sincere question. She says, are you happy? And he says, my what? And then she ran up the front door and gently entered her house. And then it's this question here. And, and we'll leave off here. We're not going to get into the part with Mildred. We'll get into that next time. Yeah. This innocent question, are you happy? That sticks with Montag. It's like a splinter mm. in his mind. This question now, 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 you could say, she, see, she didn't wait for an answer. She asked him the question, and then she left. This question causes him to think. 
actually causes him to self-reflect. And Clarice, is she, did she do that on purpose? Because she didn't sit there and wait for him to answer. She just wanted to get him thinking. Yes, you know, so I think she asked that question on purpose and then took off because he'd have to actually think about it. Because he said, am I what? And then she leaves. And then he starts, well, he's like, he, he does the normal stuff. Of course, I'm happy. <laughs> of course. Yeah. You know, of course. What does she think? But then he enters his house. And then you see the way his life is. And he comes to the realization, I'm not happy. And he came to that on his own. Because Clarice prompted him to start thinking. And he started thinking. And he realized, I have got to make some changes. This is not right. This is not good. And that's what conviction does. And that, there, there's so much here in these first few pages with Montag and Clarice that really set the stage for the rest of the story. And uh, there's a big difference between Clarice and his wife, Mildred. She's just a terrible person, right? And, and anyway, we'll get into her next time. But he sees the difference now. After interacting with a real life person, he sees the difference between Clarice and his wife, Mildred. Mm -hmm. And he sees that there's more out there. And not just more, but something better. I thought I had it all here, but man, there's something. This is nothing. There's something better out there. All because he interacted with somebody who caused him to think think and she challenged him and not in a bad way not in a rude way she just challenged him and that's what i think this book can really do for us today i think it's so important today if we look at this book and see we all want to be montag or we all want to be clarice but maybe some of us need to realize you know what maybe i'm Beatty, maybe i'm mildred maybe i'm faber maybe i'm a big coward mm -hmm. and we got to this books like this can challenge us. All right. I'm not happy. I'm not happy. I can either sit around and be a mealy mouth, little whiny baby about it and blame other people and make excuses, or I can think and do something to change my circumstances. I don't have to accept this. All I got to do is think and make it better. And that's mm -hmm. what I think this book, that's why I think this book is so important. What do you think? We need to close us out here. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think a book like this is, but any of these dystopian books, it always makes me think, well, what, now what would I would do in this situation? Because you see what you, we see what we do in, in real life that a lot of times we've, we've made the same choices over and over. And so we're not thinking about the nature of it. And a lot of these dystopian books, they sort of strip it down. It's kind of an extreme situation. Like, I don't think you would, I don't think it's very really realistic that you'd ever mm -hmm. be in a society that's actually banning all books and so forth. But it's, it's a useful idea because it makes you think well if, if i lived in this society what would i do who would i be i mean you're asking those questions would you be favor would you be mildred i mean it's i i think that's the question we need to ask um, mm -hmm. what would i do because you're, you're preparing yourself for you know what may come up situations that may come up in your life I, that's one thing i think you get out in a lot of these books you're thinking about different situations and you put yourself in that place and it's like the practicing for a decision that you may make or you're getting insight into decisions that you actually are making every day that you don't think about anymore. Right. And I, I think that this book is going to really do a good job. It really helped me a lot to read it now. I think the last yeah. time I read it was over 10 years ago. Uh, I was well over 10 years ago. And I'm reading it now and seeing how society is now and seeing the temptations like we talked about to check your phone rather than read, mm -hmm. uh, to see all that now. I don't want to be these brain dead zombies here. I want to be somebody who's like, and if society considers me an oddball, then so be it. But at least I'll be alive and I'll be an oddball with people who really care about me, my, my family who actually want to interact with me. And I think that this book is a really eye opening book and we're going to get into some of the darker elements of it uh, in the, the next episode, but we're going to go ahead and end it for now. I really like this interaction with Montag. Oh, no, no, I have one more thing to say. Oh yeah, sure. Go for it. Um, no, I read it probably, I think, 18 years ago, and I had the same reaction reading it again now, and you realize how much our society has changed in the last 18 years. The last time I read this book, smartphones didn't exist, mm -hmm. um, and so the book kind of resonated. I mean, like, you see the, the situations, you're like, oh, it's a the world, they burn the books, et cetera, et cetera, but it's very, very striking now and really brings to light the ways we've changed, the way I have changed as a person. <laughs> Yeah, because I live in a world with smartphones. I got a smartphone right here. I got 
text messages coming up and you know, I'm like, oh, I need to check my email, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, you know, the last time I, it's almost like you measure yourself against these books when you reread them and you think the last time I read this book, that wasn't me, but now that is me. I've changed for the worse. And what can I do to fix that? Right, and that's why books like this are so important. They help you realize that. Yes. They, they, right. they are the, the book is Clarice. Mm-hmm. That's you know, right. <laughs> the that's book right. is Clarice. It, it presents you with those uncomfortable truths and causes you to turn a corner in your life. And we mm-hmm. all have to be Montag. And the book is Clarice. Evie, I think you summed it up perfectly right there. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us on this episode of the Moral of the Story podcast. Be sure to tune in next time when we continue our discussion of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Until then, take care of yourselves out there. <laughs>